both here at Name One, God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we may come into your home, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's a living word, Lord, and it's meant to, to wash us. So, Lord, I ask that you be with us this morning, Lord, when we dive into your word, Lord. I ask that you give us a, just something that we can apply to our lives today, Lord. I don't want this to be a meeting where we get together and we just hear a lot of nice stuff, Lord, because we know that your word is nice, Lord, but we also know that it's a double-edged sword. So, Lord, I ask that, uh, that you use it, Lord, just to, to sanctify us, Lord, to guide us. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord, and that today's word may be edifying. And I ask that you uh, hear these prayers lifted in the session of all your saints from our tears. Here's we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for as a kingdom and the power, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so, welcome back. Um, just to, to always keep me humble, because it seems like this never gets answered correctly. Um, who knows what series we're in? Miracles. Miracles, all right, there we go. Someone's paying attention. So, and one of the things that we've been talking about in this miracle series is the fact that there's so much to these miracles. And a lot of the times what happens is when we're looking at a miracle, we get like kind of pulled into like the actual miracle that takes place. But we never, we never kind of really get to dive in and kind of peel the onion a little bit. So I love these series because it gives us an opportunity to kind of get a little bit deeper into these miracles. And um, I will tell you that, so it seems as if, and you guys are probably going to be really, really excited about this, but they, they want everything to get out at the same time, which is 1145, okay? So now, the longer you can push me from starting, that means the shorter talk that you're going to receive, right? So what happens is it looks like it's going to be like a straight sprint to the end of the finish line today because um, I, it took me a long time to get Barca from Sayedna. So <laughs> like now, I've got less than 20 minutes to wrap this thing up. But I will tell you, it's a great miracle. This is one of those miracles that I feel that we don't talk a lot about, but I think there's a lot to it. I think it's very applicable to us as well. And it's a miracle that something kind of strange happens in it. So um, it's clear that like Christ was like making a point in this. And so if you could, if you open up to Luke 17, Luke 17, um, it's going to be from verses 11 to 19. And before, actually, before we even jump into this miracle, I want, you know, everyone to open up the notes app in your phone. Okay, I'm assuming everybody has iPhones, but um, I'm sure that on Samsung there's something similar to a note app. But if you open up your note app, I want everyone just to type in one thing that God did that was so big that you were so thankful for it when it happened. You know, I'm not talking about like, you know, I went to the mall and I paid for a parking spot and like lo and behold, like that one right up in front, the one like the perfect spot was open. I'm talking about something so big that you were like, God did, you know, like a straight huge work in my life um, and something in denial and I, when it happened it floored you and that's how thankful you were about it so i'll give you guys all a minute to, to piece that together real quick you're gonna need longer than a minute no you don't have to write the whole story uh, the, guys don't write the testimony in the in the app right i'm <laughs> just <laughs> just just something for you to remember <laughs> what, what it was okay <laughs> So Meg is typing, I remember I woke up and it was cloudy outside and yeah, no, we don't need any of that. But all right, now I'm going to just read through 17, Luke 17, 11 through 19 really fast. So, uh, now what happened? As he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He had entered into a certain village, remember that, certain village, and he met, and there met him 10 men who were leopards, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice glorifying God. And he fell on his face at his feet, saying, uh, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? <clears throat> were there any found who returned to give glory except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Wow. You know, <clears throat> there's, there's so many different layers of this. And the first thing that kind of stood out to me when I look at this story is this is a great, like, point in time where we can see 
Christ is willing for healing, right? Like Christ is willing. And, and it's one of the things I know we've talked about kind of week after week, but you're going to see, it says when Christ went into this village, went into that village, and he came across these people. And he, one of the reoccurring themes, if you actually, if you got like a Bible search software, if you just type in and healed all who were sick, you're going to see that that's like a reoccurring theme with, throughout the Gospels, right? Like he would go somewhere and he would heal all who were sick all who had iniquity, all who had infirmity, right? All of these things. And there's just another example of the fact that like, you know, he's willing, right? Like, like God is so willing to offer hearing, uh, healing. And I think one of the things, especially when we start think, thinking about like this situation here, I wonder how many of them got leprosy by their own doing. Like it was like, it was nothing short of like their own fault, right? It could be people they were hanging around that they weren't supposed to hang around, places that they were probably weren't supposed to be that, you know, they knew was like a high risk situation. Um, but I wonder how many of these 10, and in my personal opinion, in my head, the way that this works out, it's a high number, um, not all, but a high number, that it was their own bad decisions that got there. And, <clears throat> and then it's just like, you know, but they see Christ walking by, and that one visit kind of changed everything for them, right? And I think before we can understand, like, really what this, what this miracle kind of means is we have to understand, like, kind of like the depth of the, bro the brokenness of these 10 lepers, because really what these 10 lepers, right, they lived in this certain city, right? Does anyone know anything about these certain, like that certain city? Well, that certain city was a city that was designated for lepers. Like that's, that was that, you know, it wasn't a coincidence that 10 of them were just happened to be hanging out together, right? Because these 10 men had lost the ability to live. And at this time, leprosy was like the most dreaded um, disease that there was out there because, you know, there was no solution for it. There was no, there were, you know, there's only two types of people, the people, you know, who had leprosy and the people who were dead from leprosy, right? Like if you ever came into contact with leprosy and you, and you contracted it, then that's the only way it was going to end, right? So the second that you hear you have leprosy, you know that like this isn't going to end well for you, right? And then that when you start actually even going in a little bit deeper, right? So, okay, you hear you got leprosy and that stinks, right? Because you know that basically that's a death sentence for you. Right? But then when you actually start looking at the disease itself, well, this disease that attacks you know, your skin and your nervous system at the same time. So literally, the people with leprosy, they're, you know, they would rot away, starting at the skin. Okay? And then it would cause these deep sores. So you can imagine the, oh, like just the, the, the pain that you would feel from these sores, right? these open sores. Now imagine how painful that would be Imagine that it would attack your nervous system, how painful that would be. Now, the problem is, is you think like, man, Pete, that's bad. That's as bad as it can get. Well, the problem with leprosy is that as it had advanced and as it had attacked your skin, your nervous system and caused these great deep you know, sores, um, eventually you would go numb and you'd feel absolutely no pain at all. And what seems like that might be a blessing because you'd been in so much pain, um, it actually made things so much worse because a person would no longer feel their, when they're hurt. They, would they wouldn't feel the sores. They wouldn't feel anything. Every cut, every wound, every burn, everything, you know, all of that, they would be numb to it. And that would lead them to what would actually ultimately kill them, which was usually massive infection, right? So you've got like this horrible, painful disease. And then when you start getting relief, then you're even more terrified because you don't even know like what's going on, and you know that that's what's ultimately going to kill you. And leprosy, like I said, it only ended one way, and it was death. And it was contagious by touch. So, you know, they would be exiled to these certain villages, um, and they wouldn't be allowed anyone else. Uh, they wouldn't be allowed around anyone else. So they created these leper colonies, and this is where people would pretty much go just to die together. So you can imagine, like, the misery now, when you start thinking about this and you start looking about, okay, well, how does this relate to us, right? Well, the reality of it is, you know, I think a lot of us have leprosy today, but it just takes a different form. And I think a, a lot of the way that we're living our lives and some of the decisions that we're making and, and, and things that we're doing, you know, we're literally living a death sentence, you know, but for us, it might not be a physical thing. I believe that it's a spiritual thing. You know, and some of the sin that we commit, you know, and I think about this all the time, right? Like, imagine the first time you committed a new sin, right? Like, it was hard. Like, there's a lot of times that we allow, like, a new sin into our life. We wrestle with it, 
right? And we fight it and we don't want to do it, right? And then if we actually make the mistake and we fall into it, how painful is that, right? Like usually right after that, we offer like a repentance and a guilt and a shame and, and all of these things, right? But after time, right? Because that sin, once we allow it in, and we allow it in again, and we allow it in again and again and again, what ultimately ends up happening? We all become numb. We completely end up becoming numb, numb to that sin, and ultimately that's what ends up killing us spiritually, right? So imagine the brokenness of these 10 men when they found out that they had leprosy. Imagine that when they had to actually pack up and leave to go to this new colony, or this new village, saying goodbye to all of their loved ones. You know, at this point, they're leaving their family. Can't even hug them. You can't touch them. You can't anything. But you're, you're literally, you know, you, you can't hug your kids, your family, your friends goodbye. You can't do any of that, right? The, the, the second you're leaving your, your bedroom and knowing that, like, I'm never coming back to sleep on my bed, right? Imagine what it felt like to, to even moving forward, being like, I, I, we can't have, like, even physical contact with other people, right? And it even makes a point in this, in this story here. It says that they... <laughs> They saw Jesus and they yelled from afar off. Afar off, right? Why? Because they weren't allowed to be any closer, to never be able to touch anyone, right? And I'll tell you, and this is something that, you know, you think about, and, and I know that we've got, like, for example, Maggie, who's, you know, she's got, it's like, um, if, how do kids develop if they're not touched and hugged and loved on, right? Not well. Right? So you, you imagine start thinking about a life where there's, there's no touching. Right? Like you think about how that is. And I'll, and I'll tell you, even culturally for us, like, you know, we might have grown up in some of those houses, right? Like, might not have been a lot of touching, not, might not have been a lot of affection. There might not, and I'm telling you, it's important. So, so make sure that you're hugging and kissing and, and, and loving on your kids, especially dads. Because the older I get and the more I talk to, like, you know, youth and stuff like that, I start seeing that, like, guys, as dads, we have so much power in our households, right? And you can lean into that and you can really just lean into your kids and make sure that they grow up well balanced or if you pull back from that, then that, it's, it creates some deep wounds, right? So imagine these guys, they, they know the second that they become you know, lepers that never be able to hold a job again, never be able to go to church, to worship, um, never, be able, never be welcomed into anyone else's homes, never any gatherings, you know, like that's it. Like this is a death sentence and it's, it's sad. And I know that that's one sort of brokenness, okay? We all know the brokenness of sin. And I think we've all experienced the brokenness of sin. But I'm also going to tell you, have you felt other sorts of brokenness, right? Maybe it was the day that the doctor gave you bad news about a loved one. Maybe it was the day the doctor gave you bad news about yourself, right? Maybe it was the day that when someone that we really, really loved didn't love us back. And they hurt us and they cut us, right? Maybe it's the day you looked in the mirror and you didn't like the reflection that was staring back at you. Right? There's always the day where we come face to face with our sin, and we know the sting of that brokenness. Right? So I want us to kind of just kind of think about that and understand where these men are at, and if we can relate to them. You know, and I think that if we, if we understand the brokenness of these 10 men, it will shed like a huge light like on this miracle that's coming. Because like, I will remember um, there was a certain retreat we did at St. John. It was forever ago. Um, and I remember the, the theme of it was, was darkness to light. And I remember it was a four-day retreat. And I still remember that there was not one night of that retreat that we didn't get to bed before like 3 or 4 a.m. And I just remember because it, you know, it was kid after kid after kid just bawling and miserable because we were talking about exposure, right? Like we have so much that we keep in the dark, right? But Christ is light. And the only way there's healing is if we shed that light on the darkness, right? So we had all of these kids that were just going all night talking about how broken they were, the sins that they were just trying to cover up, the things that they were entangled in. Like, and we're talking like bondage, like again and again and again, right? And honestly, all it was, it was all of us just realizing that we had leprosy and that we had brokenness too. So they go and they plead for Christ, right? They, they plead, right? Have mercy on us. But Christ hears them. And then he tells them something unusual. If you still have your, your Bible open, on verse 14. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priest, so that it was that as they went, they were cleansed. So it was that as they went. And I'm going to tell you that part of the story kind of floors me a little bit. 
right? Because that was a huge act of faith from them. Like you got to understand they were exiled to this leper colony, right? Like they, no one couldn't go in there and they couldn't leave, right? But at that point it took faith, right? It wasn't like they were healed yet because they weren't, right? So they made their way to the priest. They left that camp or that, that territory or that city, the village, whatever. Um, they made that, they left while they still had leprosy to go show themselves to the priest. And I just want to tell you, like, that's tough. Like, that's a level of faith that defies what we see. And we are very good at making decisions based off of what we see, what we rationalize, what we think is okay, what we think is not okay, right? But what Christ wanted them to do is he wanted them to walk in victory and show their faith. And I think there's a lot of areas of our life where God is telling us, like, hey, I need you to start walking. Like, you might not be there yet, but I need you to start walking there. Start taking that step there. Do hard things, right? And the, the, and the blessing of this story is he says, if you can do hard things and you can walk in victory, if you can walk like you believe the things that I tell you, I will heal you along the way. Like, that's where the healing comes from. And Jesus, at this point, he blesses these 10 men beyond their wildest dreams. See, not only does he heal them, but ultimately, like, if, if he just healed them, would that have been a blessing? If he would have just healed them, do you think the 10 of them would have been happy? Like, physically, if he just said, look, I just don't want to die anymore, right? Like, I'm in pain. Like, remove the pain from me. Remove the sores from me, right? If he would have just done that, then they would have been happy. Right? But he did so much more. He gives them their lives back. Because what, what Christ is basically saying to them is, go, your, go show yourself to the, to the priest. Because when he went and showed himself to the priest, the priest would give him a certificate to be able to go home. And that was a game changer for them. Right? They'd be able to go back to their families. They'd be able to go back to their lives. They can go back and have jobs. They can be a functioning part of society again. And I'm going to tell you, more, that is more, than they were looking for, 100%, right? In essence, he gave them a second chance by giving them a new life. And if you think for a moment, like you just let those words sink in, he gave them a second chance by giving them a new life. Does that sound familiar? Is that anything, do we hear anything like that anywhere else in the Bible, right? Don't you see it? Like we are these lepers. Right? We are these people that we, we get stuck in sin. We make bad decisions. Our decisions should be leading us to death, isolation, misery, everything else you can even think of. Right? But what he does is he gives us freedom because the second that he forgave us, right, he gave us a second chance in a new life. We are these lepers. Right? And I think that that's great, but I think if we just stop there, like we're missing something. Right? So my question is, is like, I think we can all agree like we are these lepers. We have way more blessing than we deserve. We got way more than we ever signed up for. He gave us more than we ever deserved. Like, I, I'm telling you, like, it's just a game changer on what happened. Because when Christ walked into our life, everything should have changed. Like, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, anyone who comes to Christ is a new creation. The old things are past. And if you're not walking in that freedom, then, then maybe we need to start there. Okay? But I'm going to tell you, we can all agree we're like the 10. But the real question is, are you like the 9? Or are you like the one? Because there's a clear differentiation between the two of them. Because all of those 10 were cleansed that day. But only one came back. Only one came back. So what was the problem, right? See, because, and, and here's the thing that I was trying to kind of wrestle with when I was thinking about this, because I feel like sometimes when Jesus blesses us in amazing ways, right? When we get like just something that's just total grace, we can get so focused on the blessing that we totally forget about the person who blessed us, the giver of the blessing, right? For these nine, it could have been their wives, their kids, their friends. It could have been the fact that they were able to go back to society. You know, like that was so much for them that once they got the blessing, they were like, I'm just going to blow, I'm, I'm enjoying the fruit of the blessing, right? And these are things that God gave me, so I'm, I am right to enjoy them all. And I think there's a lot of times where, you know, that is very, very real for us. Right, where we, we end up enjoying the blessings, knowing that they're God-given blessings, and we are in full enjoyment of them. But we forget like the provider of that blessing. 
right? Just to make it practical, right? It could be, it could be a spouse, right? Like when we, get, we marry somebody who's a little bit outside of our league. Uh, <laughs> a little outside of our league, right? Like we get so focused on the blessing, right? And we just go all into that relationship, right? And then all of a sudden, we're not as fervent in our prayers. We're not fervent in our Bible. We're not, in, not church, not any of this other stuff. There's other times it could be a new possession. It could be a new car. It could be a new job. It could be a promotion. Promotion. We get sucked into that a lot where we're doing really well at work and we're like, God's blessing me at work. So what do we do? We end up working more and more and more and more. And God's like, I gave that to you. And now you're using that to like, you know, you're, you're making an idol, right? Because now that job is more important than the person who gave you the job. So how many times have we just taken things for granted, right? And we, and we lean into that blessing, but we totally forget about the source of it. And that's what happened here. I think the nine saw when they were cleansed, and they went their way, right? And they were walking in the light of a blessing that they, that they were thankful for, but they didn't, it didn't move them to do anything about it, right? And if you're really thankful, if you're really thankful about something that God did in your life, it has to move you to action. It has to move you to action. Because if you, if you say that you're thankful, but it hasn't changed any of your behaviors, then how thankful are you in reality? Because being thankful must change your behavior. And what you see here is that all 10 men were cleansed, but only one was healed. I just want you to kind of like wrap your mind around that, right? All 10 men were cleansed, but only one was healed. So let me explain that, right? Because all 10 men had leprosy removed and it, it solved their physical problem. Their bodies were made whole but only one man actually realized what happened. Because that was miraculous. Like that was a big deal. Like this was not the sort of thing that was happening all of the time, right? And when he realized that a miracle had happened, he had to go back and to thank the person who did it because he knew that there was something different here. 10 were cleansed, one was healed because one learned who the savior was, who the Messiah was, who God was, and he figured it out. He knew that this man must have been more. There had to be more to this man. And whatever this man showed him in the healing, he says that I owe him a lot more. Like I have to respond. I have to give this man a certain area of my life. Like I have to elevate him in a way. I cannot see what this man did, which was clearly miraculous, and go back like life never, like, like life, life never changed. It has to change. So do you think that Christ does things for us just because he loves to bless us? Do you think he says, oh man, he doesn't have enough money. I'm going to give him a little bit more money or, you know, he, he deserves a, be you know, a better half. I'm going to give him a better half. Like in reality, we have to say like, you know, what is, what's behind all of these blessings, right? And we've seen it in all of the miracles we've covered in this series, right? There's always more behind all of these blessings. And every single time of it, it's about our relationship with God. So why did he bless his 10 men? Because he wanted them to come back. His desire was then for them to come back, right? He wanted a deeper and more intimate relationship with them, right? He wants a deeper and an intimate relationship with us for us to invest more and to come back to him when we see his goodness. See, because the nine found the relief they were searching for, but only one found healing and a savior. Do you see the difference? Because I feel many of us were in that same position, right? Where we found relief in Christ, we found blessings in Christ. We found good things from Christ. Even his teachings are solid. I tell people this all the time. If you want to be atheist, <laughs> rock on, but follow his teaching because his teaching's solid. If you just follow his teaching, you're going to live a happier life, right? And, it's, and that's very, very possible. But the reality of it is, is he, he blesses and he does all of these things for us to draw us into a deeper relationship with him. He wants to do more than just heal and bless. He wants to solve our sin problem and he wants to make us whole. And he has so much more to offer and I believe that we limit him. Technically, I'm the one who's running long. That's my bad. Sorry guys, I'll wrap this up. I should have been done four minutes ago. <clears throat> so I will tell you, and this is, this, is, this is huge, right? So one comes back and one man praises God and thanks him for the healing. And Jesus starts with, this, with these questions when he comes back. And he comes back to Christ, and, and when you, and you read it, it almost seems like Christ is a little aggressive here. He says, were not all ten cleansed? 
Jesus knew that they were all cleansed. Not only did he knew they were all cleansed, he knew exactly where they were, right? He knew everything. He's all-knowing. But what he did is he did it in front of all of these people because he wanted everybody to know. Where are the other nine? Jesus knew that answer. Where, why are there nowhere to be found? They got their blessings and they left for what they considered other blessings. And then he says something. He says, none but this foreigner. You're like, that's tough, right? Like, you got Christ who's saying none but this foreigner. Like, come on, Christ. He's the only one that came back, right? And you're going to downplay him like that? And it's crazy because he's basically saying is like, you know, you had, the other nine might have been Jews. Like, the other, the other nine took the Jews, the, the Jews, they took the blessing and they left, right? They took it for granted. But the foreigner came back. Is there a little foreshadowing going on in there? Of course there is, right? Um, and it's touchy, right? Because the Jews missed it and the Samaritan's the one who got it. And, and I will tell you that that is something that's a very powerful thing inside the walls of this church. And we all need to wrap our mind about this, right? It's not just because we're Coptic. It's not just because we're a great deacon. It's not just because we memorize the entire Bible, if you have, right? Because faith without works is dead. And that's like the highlighting theme, like in this, in this miracle, right? The Samaritan works allowed Christ to esteem him more than the Jews who didn't have the work. And he condemned them. So the question is, is are you living a life of gratitude for the blessings of Christ? You know, the black drop to this passage right before what happens here, it says in verse 11, it says that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And I think like sometimes when it, like we read straight through something without connecting all of the dots, right? But that he was on his way to Jerusalem. And I believe that these things are connected because what happens in Jerusalem? Jerusalem, he does a great work, right? Because it's, it's a foreshadow of the crucifixion, right? So he does a great work, right? Who rejects? The Jews. Who accepts? Samaritans, right? So it's this, this, this huge thing, right? And it, I don't believe, I, there's, there's no chance that this is an accident that Christ chooses to stop here. It's not a chance that Jesus heals the 10 men here. It's not, it's not an accident, you know, that, that they were all healed. There's not a, it's not an accident that one came back to give glory to God, right? So now I want everyone just to take a second, and you might remember it, you might not, but open up that, that notes app, right? And read what you wrote down. And think about how you felt when Christ did that for you. Think about, did you make promises? Did you make vows? Did you thank him? And now that probably some time has passed between that, that big miracle and like now, the question is, is, you know, have you forgotten the giver and now you're just thankful for the gift? Like, what does that look like in your life? Because some of us, we, we forget about the giver and then enough time passes by, we actually even forget about the gift. Because the gift is temporary, but I ask that you never forget about the giver because the relationship with God is forever and it's eternal. So, are you the one? Are you the nine? I pray we're all the one. Chances are a lot of us are nines. Um, but we can change that. And the best way to change that is to do exactly what that one did is we need to show it with our actions. Amen? All right, sorry, I went, ran a little bit long. I'm going to try, we'll try to start earlier. Well, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, because there's so much truth in that word. And I love all of these characters, Lord, that we can kind of dive into and we can see exactly where we where we stand, Lord. And in a situation like this, Lord, there's, you know, we see your goodness, we see your love, we see your blessings, your heart for healing, Lord, your heart to draw us into relationship, Lord. And, and I see that all 10 were, were made well, Lord, physically. But Lord, we also see that, you know, I, I, I confess that so many times, Lord, that I'm so stuck on what you've done for me, Lord, that I, I forget to circle back and just kind of like to thank you Lord, to realize that it's from your goodness and your love and your kindness. And so, Lord, I ask that just as a group here, Lord, that we always look to you. Lord, that we don't get distracted by the gift, Lord, but we keep our eyes on the giver. So, Lord, I ask that you bless us until we meet again next week. Lord, I ask that this be a week, Lord, that is full of your glory, Lord, full of your presence. I ask that you carve out time for every single one of us here, Lord, that we may sit with you for even if it's just a matter of minutes a day, Lord, to be in your word, to stay in your presence, Lord. And I ask that you grow our faith like a muscle. Lord, that you, that you just work with us, Lord, and that you do not leave us as we are, 
but that you just feed into us and that you build into us. I ask that you be with us in this fast, Lord. I ask that you just teach us how to fast and to discipline our bodies, Lord. I ask that you teach us how to feed our flesh, I mean, uh, feed our spirit, Lord, and that you teach us how to pray more and to be in your word, Lord. And I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. You forgive us all of our sins. The sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary. All your saints from our tears. Here's we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from Christ Jesus, our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My pleasure.